this is a little something called being proactive. Uh, right now it's about mid-March, uh, coming up on April 5th, in case you weren't aware of it, it's the 20th anniversary of the suicide death of Kurt Donald Cobain, uh, frontman from Nirvana and a most overrated icon of the 1990s. Um, this is a little bit different from some of my prior videos. Obviously bands like the Beatles and Led Zeppelin I completely detest. I really can't say anything positive about them at all. Whereas with Nirvana, I can at least give them a little bit of credit. They do have a couple of good songs, and overall, I think they're an alright band for the most part. Well, let me rephrase that. I think they're two-thirds of a good band. Dave Grohl and uh, the bass guy looks like Andy Kaufman. I think uh, they're a really good musical core, but my problem with Nirvana, and it's going to sound very strange to a lot of you uh, 90s kids and Cobain sycophants, the problem I've had with the band has always been Kurt Cobain himself. He was this sort of self-deified Jim Morrison tragic made for cable synthetic plastic MTV saint figure and I think uh, looking at his overall quality as a musician and certainly as a human being an ambassador for an entire generation he probably doesn't deserve any of the sort of you know uh, retroactive um, reverence that he receives from the masses to begin with when we talk about Kurt Cobain Let's talk about him first and foremost as guitarist, because I can't tell you how many times I've flipped through Spin and Rolling Stone and even Guitar Player and all these magazines that nobody reads anymore. And they do periodically these countdowns of like the 100 best uh, guitarists of all time. And for some reason, Kurt Cobain always makes a list despite the fact that he's probably not even one of the 100 best guitarists in the state of Washington. I think he's clearly a figure who does not have the amount of talent that a guy like I don't know if Chuck Schoenner might have, but you never see on these lists because he's in a type of music which is not really mainstream, that isn't vaunted and celebrated by the mainstream press. Whereas Kurt Cobain, who is by all uh, intents and purposes a terrible, terrible guitarist, always makes the countdowns and generally quite high based simply upon his uh, cultural presence, I would say. I don't think another thing is nobody really brings up, he's really not that great of a singer either. I mean, you look at his vocals, he always kind of reminded me of uh, Ed Furlong in Terminator 2. You know, the little kid who was, all the time he talked, his voice cracked. You know, it seemed very, um, not, not very pleasing. It sounded a little abrasive, and I can never get into it. And as far as him being a, a great vocalist, I mean, come on. How many bands since have easily replicated the signature Cobain howl? I mean, you got the guy from Seether and Puddle of Mud can pull it off today. I mean, how hard can it be? It's not as bad as the Vetter voice, but it's certainly, certainly an annoyance nonetheless. Now let's talk about uh, Kurt Cobain's lyrics, because he was the main writer for Nirvana songs. And one of the commonalities of all the Nirvana songs is the fact that none of them make any sense. And uh, that's because Kurt Cobain was a terrible poet who didn't really care about his lyrics. In fact, he would be the first person to admit that himself. He said it countless times that his lyrics just didn't matter. And when he wrote songs, they weren't really about themes or narratives or even touching upon certain sociocultural things. It was just him going through his crappy notebooks and pulling out, you know, lyrics and copying and pasting them and singing to them. So it's very disjointed. You really don't have anything in the Nirvana discography that I think is above your basic refrigerator magnet poetry. And of course, the influence on popular culture and music as a whole has been clearly disastrous because ever since then, Pretty much every band out there on a major record label thinks they can, you know, just go out there and sing absolute nonsense. You know, like Rob Zombie, I think he's a perfect example. You know, just listen to any song, there's, there's no actual lyrical content. Mud, bath, acrobat, that stuff doesn't make any sense, it's just words. And I think, uh, well, we're seeing that now. I mean, the White Stripes do that too. Um, just completely plotless, completely meandering, completely cut and pasted. I mean, they're not really songs anymore. It's about stories, but now they're just random words trying to get it to a beat. I mean, what's the point of that? It's like playing with confetti when there's no reason to celebrate, in my humble opinion. So that's, of course, a very negative thing to say about this Kerbane fellow. Another thing, uh, the general discography, I think, of Nirvana is vastly overrated. Kurt Cobain himself absolutely hated Nevermind. He said it was overproduced. First time he heard In Bloom, he wanted to cry. He said he wanted to rename the album Sheep because he realized some people was going to buy it. It was just a complete overproduced, uh, you know, turd of a album. But it became popular. I mean, there were some good songs on it, I can't lie, but it wasn't really um, the, the 
punk rock alternative masterpiece that he had wanted to craft. In fact, it shared way too many similarities with a lot of the classic AOR uh, albums from the past that were completely overproduced and plastic sounding. So he's a hypocrite. It's a great way to do it. Um, in Utero, I think it was a complete compromise. Uh, Cobain himself said that. He wanted to make it a really abrasive, almost sort of like a Bleach 2 album. But of course, the record company said, no, we need more acoustic slowdown stuff. So you have a lot of really awkward placeholders in there, like Dumb and uh, Penny Royalty, which just seem completely out of place. And it's not a great album. I think his over his Nevermind is In Utero is even more overrated, because at least there's a couple of good songs on Nevermind, where In Utero is just meandering. Uh, then you got the other albums, Incesticide and Unplugged in New York. They had their strong points, but after near at least half of the material on that are cover tunes or proofs of recorded material. It's kind of a wash. So that leaves, you know, their uh, debut album, which ironically enough is also their less celebrated album, Bleach from 1989, as being their truly uncompromised uh, work of art. And I really actually do like Bleach, one of my favorite albums in the 1980s. Yet sadly, in the Nirvana of the 90s, we received was anything but the band I thought could have uh, really been a great Tad-esque, Melvins-esque, uh, regional favorite. Then you talk about their song and style. You know, they do a lot of 70s rock pastiches, which is kind of funny because, you know, they're trying to uh, kind of make fun of that old macho-ness, when in fact the matter is so much of their discography is just complete, you know, derivative of CCR and Boston and Louie Louie. Of course, we all heard Smells Like Teen Spirit, which is, um, you know, basically just Louie Louie's bass line with uh, more than a feeling serving as the bridge. So it's very derivative. I mean, even as a joke, it's a little bit on the nose. Um, basically, you know, all they did was take uh, the Stooges fuzz, amp it up, and basically create the distorted sound, which kind of their signature, and unfortunately a horrible, horrible uh, trademark of 1990s alternative music. The Stooges are a good band, though, whereas Nirvana, I think, uh, for the most part, is quite overrated. You know, I always talk about Nirvana being a shameless, uh, basically a Pixies cover band. And while that influence is obvious, I think the band that they probably stole the most from that no one ever talks about is Steve Albani's Big Black. All you have to do is go back, listen to their albums, just take out all the synth, amp up the distortion, and basically you've got Nirvana 10 years before Nirvana was around. So go into YouTube, type that Big Black, and you'll see where Nirvana got their uh, original uh, sound and technique. And of course, you all know Come As You Are is a complete ripoff of uh, the 80s by Killing Joke, which itself is a ripoff of... Uh, Life Goes On by The Damned. So they're like double ripoff artists in that way. Not really a horribly original band as far as content, style, or actual musical ability. Um, as far as them being grunge innovators, you know, let's call it like it is. This was a completely manufactured album. I obviously had Alice in Chains and Soundgarden had their major label records uh, in 1990 come out, a full year before Nevermind, but they never get the same credit. Um, and of course you had plenty of bands out there I think could have been a Nirvana-esque success if they had been given the same Devin Geffen treatment that Nirvana did. Bands like The Melvins, uh, Mother Love Bone, Mud Honey, Green River. All these bands I think could have been really huge uh, generational successes, but they didn't have uh, the sort of financial backing. They didn't have the media blitzkrieg behind them the way that Nirvana did, which I think we all know by now is pretty much just a David Geffen engineered ploy to get rid of the hair bands and bring out something new to trot out and completely saturate the market with and just run into the ground until we're all sick of it. So, you know, really Nirvana, they really aren't really responsible for their own success. I think they're just the right act at the right time. And I think any number of the bands, you know, the mentioned above, like, uh, you know, Mud Honey or even the Screaming Trees probably could have been Nirvana had uh, one of the record labels gotten behind them first. So congratulations, uh, you're a huge success and a huge generationally defining band through no effort of your own. Hope you like that. Uh, and then of course, I think probably my biggest problem with Kurt Cobain is the fact that he's just this guy that's celebrated as a pop culture icon, even though he had absolutely nothing at all to say about the 1990s culture at large. You know, he was a guy that was a, you know, really a hypocrite too. You know, he comes out as you know the anti axel Rose. He's doing all these interviews. Oh, I'm. I'm anti-misogyny, I'm anti-homophobia, I'm anti-racism. Not that, you know, the hair metal bands uh, before them were actually the epitome of that. But, um, which is funny, you know, Guns N' Roses always gets uh, they're the, the band that's always kind of rolled its point is uh, the anti-Nirvana, right? 
you know, because Axl Rose is a racist and a misogynist. You know, that's why he let Slash, who's half African American, play in his band. Just throwing it out there. In case you can't tell, I prefer hair metal to grunge. If I had one overproduced, oversaturated, pop cultural, mass engineered musical uh, trend to deal with, I'm going to take uh, Twisted Sister and Skid Row over Stone Temple Pilots and Oasis. Ugh. So anyway, Cobain, he's a guy that's always going around about women's rights, but even in his book uh, journals, uh, which Courtney Love, I hope, made a lot of money off of, you know, he said, you know, when he was a kid, he molested a mentally retarded girl. So there you go. Uh, he's the kind of guy that always went on these, you know, tirades about uh, meat eating and being a proponent of animal rights. But what do you know? When he was a kid, he killed a cat. So he's a hypocrite there. He's always gone about anti-violence and uh, especially anti-violence towards women. But, you know, you look at his journals, it just completely spills all these just ridiculous, over-the-top, adolescent, you know, masternalized violence fantasies against jocks. So if you're into hot dogs and playing football, he wants you dead just because he's a nerd. He's really kind of more akin to a Columbine kid than I think he is any sort of true generational mascot. So if you like a ceaseless, remorseless violence, you're going to enjoy some Cobain. And of course, you know, he's always decrying the macho hair metal stuff, Guns N' Roses, Skid Row, stuff like that. When the fact of the matter is, he was out there pretty much doing all the same excesses he decried. He was out there shooting heroin into his veins. He was out there, you know, being with groupies, basically doing all the things that he criticized, which makes him a through and through hypocrite. And like I said before, this guy really had absolutely nothing at all to say. You know, even with someone like Bob Dylan or even John Lennon, as much as I hate to say it, you know, at least they tried to make their, their songs and lyric statements about something ongoing, reflecting on culture. Whereas with Nirvana, you just get stuff like an albino, a mosquito, my libido, which is absolute nothingness. Such a great nihilistic way of uh, pinning music. But of course, you know, I think that the big hypocrite, hypocritic point with uh, this Cobain fellow is, you know, his entire musical oeuvre was based upon being in a broken home, about how his parents completely sold out and destroyed his life, but couldn't, couldn't be together and all these things. But what does he go out and do? What's his big trademark? What's the thing coming up in a couple of weeks? Has all the money in the world? But I can buy all the drugs in the world? Fame? Renown? What does he do? He blows his brains out. He ruins his own family. His daughter doesn't have a dad. So basically, even though he made an entire fortune off decrying uh, the baby boomers and their inability to keep up a family and support their kids, what does he go out and do? The exact same thing. He kills himself so he can't support his kid. Good job, buddy. What a, what a great father figure. Oh, so uh, right there, he's not really a completely respectable figure at all. If you admire him, you're probably a scumbag. And of course, you can't talk about their music because it's had such a pervasive influence. You know, Woe Is Me, Beta Men, Alternative Rock, Springs from the default setting for alternative music for 20 years. I mean, even now you've got real crybabies like Radiohead and Waves still doing the same old post Nirvana. I'm a crybaby, the world sucks, depression music. Which, uh, you know, I don't know, it's been here for 20 years, maybe here for another 20. Maybe this is like a, the new uh, standard of rock. So, uh, I don't know, they had some good songs, but they're vastly overrated. I think, you know, if you compare what Nirvana did overall to, you know, the first two Foo Fighters albums, it's not even close. Dave Grohl, you know, he went the Weezer route, he at least had two albums that were pretty good compared to Nirvana's discovery, I think they're just vastly overrated. And I'm going to talk about this is a band whose entire career spanned, what, 1987 to 1994? I mean, it's not an awfully long time for a band to be around, uh, kind of that pervasive influence, but they get all the credit. And a lot of people always kind of wonder, you know, where would we be musically? Because I remember in the 90s, Kurt Cobain was celebrated as like, the savior of music. Like, we were waiting for him to come back like Jesus. You know, he's the guy that saved uh, us from all the hair bands in the early 90s, and now we're waiting for that new organization to come around and really shift up the landscape. I don't think it's really worth you know, shifting up the landscape to begin with. I think he's made really overrated, tiresome, derivative, stupid, pointless, arbitrary music. He was an unreluctant rock star and thankfully you know, he took his coveted media position to not go out there and you know try to change the world for the better and fight some of these social prejudices he always you know, talked about in interviews. He just went out and bought heroin. I mean, hang out with Courtney Love. Do drugs, spend their fortune, don't give it to the hungry, don't give it to the poor, don't give it to the downtrodden. 
just go out there and be completely excessive. And I think he's venerated for all the wrong reasons. Well, the fact that he's venerated at all, I think, is pretty much wrong-headed as wrong-headed gets. But ultimately, you know, you look back on this tortured poet, when he's not, he doesn't deserve that. He's just some dumb kid from the sticks who got famous and didn't deserve it and had absolutely no ambitions. And, uh, you know, you hear people saying, oh, Courtney Love had him killed because conspiracy theories always puff up again, one bit illusional. Uh, people saying, you know, oh, don't, don't blame the depression, blame it on his stomach illness. Give me a break, guys. This is just a guy who had absolutely no ambition in life, had absolutely no meaning. He really should not have really risen above being a janitor in some crappy weekend band playing at loggerhead joints in Tacoma. But he became an international celebrity, had absolutely nothing positive to contribute to the world, took his own life, and now he's still celebrated as an icon. Which is, I think, one of the reasons why nobody really respects Generation X, because, you know, that's your, your big leader, this nihilistic pud. But anyway, Kurt Cobain, everybody's going to be celebrating him, everybody's going to hate this, and, you know, basically going tirades against me on why I'm wrong. The fact of the matter is, Cobain stood for absolutely nothing. He's been dead for 20 years, and honestly, I don't really miss him. Sorry, but... Just my opinion.